Welcome to episode 317 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on January 13th, 2023. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss the topic or recent news and how it relates to you. Ben is recovering from an email migration and Scott wants to hear all about it. We discuss some of the good things and some of the pains and discoveries around Microsoft 365 group mailboxes, particularly when it comes to getting mail out of them. It is Friday and I've only slept four hours. I might be all over the place today, Scott. Fair warning. (laughs) I fell asleep on the couch at like two or three o'clock while I was waiting for some stuff to run in relation to a migration and then like woke up at six and kept going. Yes. So we're going to have to talk about your migration at some point since you promised us that you could, but it doesn't sound like you're in a place where you're ready to do that. Well, so I finally got it. The thing I was struggling with last night and today, I finally, I have a workaround. I will not necessarily call this a solution. This is 100% about as hacky a workaround as you can get. Do primarily to group mailboxes, Microsoft 365 group or Office 365 group mailboxes. So I am more than willing to talk about those because I have learned a boatload about these group mailboxes in the last 24 hours that some of it I kind of knew, some of it I didn't knew and no, and some of it is just kind of wacky. Gotcha. So if you're willing to talk about it, I always love hearing about some of the real world things that you encounter on your side of the house, (laughs) because they're different than the stuff that I encounter in my world. And I love to chat about them. We should do this. So uh, let's just take a step back, kind of ground everybody in what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, and then we'll kind of talk about the pain of group mailbox migration and and what's going on All right. So backstory, what I'm trying to do, it's just, I would say it's a normal migration. So I'm going from G Suite to Office 365 mailboxes. Mix of user mailboxes and G Suite group mailboxes to either, and this is where some of this goofiness came in, is either shared mailboxes or in some cases we decided we were going to go to Office 365 group or team mailboxes, however you want to refer to them. I was used to call these shared mailboxes that were attached to Microsoft 365 groups because we've talked about this before, but that's maybe getting a little ahead of ourselves. So that's what I was doing. User mailboxes, everything works great. Shared mailboxes, Everything works great. Now I was using BitTitan for all these migrations. I was going to ask. So there is a path forward to do G Suite to M th- Office three sixty five M three sixty five. I wish they would fix this. But there is a path to do those migrations, uh, which is fairly well documented. Uh, you, you do the same thing that I, th- I think you do with a standard. Office migration. It's been a while, an exchange migration. It's been a while since I've done one, but you go through the similar flow. You have migration batches, all those kinds of things. But you said in this case you're using BitTitan, which is another awesome little migration tool. Like the whole, it's the migration whiz stack, which I have bought and purchased many times for customer migrations. And yeah, for the most part, uh, it's- wholeheartedly recommend. It's yes, pretty awesome. I agree. And it, not sponsored, anything like that. Like, no, not hey, sponsored. Uh, <laughs> and to be fair, the this migration, I don't think there's anything. I had one issue with BitTitan. Truth be told, I don't know whether it was BitTitan or Microsoft 365. But I love BitTitan. I need to figure out that threshold. And I don't know if anybody that's listening has figured this out. Because like you said, you can do these as native migrations with the tools in there. But what I have found is BitTitan has been doing it, frankly, so much longer than Microsoft's native one. And every time I've seen someone try to use the native one, they complain about stuff being broken and not working, that the time saved with BitTitan is usually worth the cost of the licenses. But I'm wondering, like, at some point in time, would you hit a threshold where if you're doing, like, a thousand mailboxes... The bit titan's going to add up and the time to set up all the integrated migration from G Suite IMAP might 
end up being less than what you would spend on BitTight licenses? I don't know where that threshold is. Yeah, I think you need to rationalize it out. So the thing about BitTight is, you know, if anybody's looking at this and you're going like, You've been frustrated by the kind of built-in migration side of Microsoft land. And admittedly, I haven't done a SharePoint migration or anything with BitTitan. Like most of my exposure is to mailboxes and exchange. That's all I use BitTitan for. But I've also done it for G Suite migrations. I've touched it for Lotus Notes Domino migrations and and run away very fast. But what it's really good for is management and visibility of the migration process. So one of the things that I was always frustrated about by built-in exchange migrations in Microsoft land is you do things like you go and submit a migration batch. You know, great, I want to migrate these 50 mailboxes here. Could be a mix of like user, shared, whatever it is. And then you always kind of like fired that batch off and then you never really knew what was happening. You kind of like watch it turn (laughs) along and you're like, sometimes it stops and you're like, hold on, are you going to get to those last 13 mailboxes? Like, what are you doing? What's happening? So there's a lack of visibility in what's going on there. So I think just from a end-to-end migration time, if you're pressed for time, Microsoft's built-in tooling doesn't always fit the need and, and and fill that gap in the right kind of way versus going over to somebody who has built a tool that's centered not only on like the very specific migration that you want to do and make you successful around it, but part of the value add I think is in the reporting and operate operationalization of that migration, which I would argue for someone like you who's being paid by a customer to execute a migration, time to migrate is a component of how you (laughs) price your migrations, price your time, what you charge your customers, and it becomes a little bit of also calculus on that side. So you can kind of build that in, and, and I think there's a lot to be said for reducing the pain of not only the end user who's going through the data motion of having their you know mailbox migrated from A to B and having to you know update client configuration deal with any issues that happen along the way but also for the folks that do it right like the, the people on the back end the engineers that execute that data movement I think it's important that you know <laughs> they get to yeah. kind of live their best life as well yep and I will say I I don't use BitTitan for really large migrations. Kind of like you said, you get a lot of that speed. Sometimes when you're doing the mailbox move, you don't have the visibility. But I'm also helping another client with one that we're moving like on the scale of thousands of mailboxes. And we're going from Exchange to Office 365. That one, like to me, those are a no-brainer. Set up hybrid so you can do batches on different weekends. You're not trying to cut over 5,000 on a weekend. This one was like 300, 350 mailboxes. Um, And it was like, it's a big bang. We're going to start it Friday, Saturday, cut everybody over over the weekend. And it was like, we don't want to set up hybrid. We're not going to live in this land for long. We just have to start all these jobs and let it crank away and get it done by Monday morning. Yep, I totally get it. Like, There's a path to go down and think about there. One of the other things that I think it's important that you know folks think about is, do you do this all the time? <laughs> and are you familiar with the edge cases? Or do you just want to rely on some kind of battle-tested wizard to do it? And I feel like I'm being a little bit of a shill here for somebody, but like, it, it really <laughs> is an awesome tool. Like, There's no enterprise gating and pricing anything like that if you're if you're an SMB and you have 10 users in G Suite and you want to go to Microsoft 365 you're talking $12 a user, 120 yep. bucks, and you can just go sign up for that today. Like you swipe your credit card and go. There's no obfuscation around enterprise pricing or call us for details, anything like that. It's like you just kind of get started. Their documentation's really good too. I will say that. Like they have all the documentation too for different endpoints of this is what you need to go do, this is all the setup steps. If you run into issues, I've also been fairly happy with their support as opposed to, we've all heard it, Microsoft 365 support can have its challenges at times and responsiveness. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Bit Titan, they're like, they'll give you a call and yeah. Their support seems to be much more responsive, even if it's 
writing regular expressions to do filters to make sure certain mail or mailboxes don't get migrated, I've been happy with their support. So I'm with you. SMB, small mailboxes, you don't do this all the time. I think it's the way to go. Yeah. So anyway, you're doing a migration. You have yep. to be using BitTai, and we're G Suite to Office 365. Let's talk about some of the frustrations, which I think are going to be more so, less BitTai in or migration focused, and more just M365 focused. <laughs> yeah, and again, not even necessarily M365 as a whole, but particularly M365 group mailboxes. Because what we did, so all the users, again, users came over just fine. We had maybe 30 or 40 group mailboxes that ended up going to shared mailboxes. We did some distribution groups instead of some shared mailboxes. But they did have some teams in place that naturally have that M365 group mailbox. These were teams that worked with this email. So we had four of these that we said, let's take this group mailbox in G Suite and let's move it into the M365 team. And this is where my first frustration started was, and this is the one I don't know where the error is. BitTitan has documentation for migrating both from and to Office 365 groups because this is my first source, a group mailbox is truly not, I don't know if it's not, if it's some obfuscated, mixed up version of a shared mailbox. But if you go into something like BitTitan or even some of the PowerShell commandlets and try to connect to a group mailbox the same way you would a shared mailbox, which my understanding, or some, and this was maybe me, some misguidedness here, was that those group mailboxes were just shared mailboxes that were secured with the Microsoft 365 group. BitTitan cannot find a group mailbox if you treat it just like you do a shared mailbox. It actually says the SMTP address cannot be found if you hit the normal Office 365 endpoint. Mm. You're referring to like the like the EWS endpoint? Yes, the EWS endpoint. Yep. So BitTitan, you go do the EWS, you go set up an application, you give it delegated rights to access on behalf access all mail on behalf of a user. I can't remember the exact one because it's not in front of me. But yeah, if you plug in a group mailbox in there, the SMTP address for it. It just says that SMTP or that SMTP address doesn't have a mailbox associated with it. So in BitTitan, they have multiple endpoints for Office 365, some of the different cloud, but then they do have a specific endpoint for groups. I could never get it to work. They have a bunch of steps. I tried it. I did reach out to support on it, and that was one I never heard back from them. So I ended up having to do a workaround, but I can never connect to that group mailbox and but again, why it's not just a shared mailbox that's secured by a group and why they did all this other goofy stuff to it. I'm sure there's reasons around teams and conversations and all of that. But what I ended up doing was I just migrated to a shared mailbox. Like I just did a shared mailbox that temp. And then I just moved email from a shared mailbox into the Microsoft 365 group via Outlook Web Access. Worked great. Like select the email, drag and drop it over and it all moved over. And then I deleted the shared mailbox. <laughs> Ugh, still rough because you're doing that by hand. <laughs> like if, if at that point, yeah. you're kind of going mailbox by mailbox. If it's a mailbox with a bunch of folders, deep hierarchies, lots of messages, like. Good luck if you're trying to migrate my mailbox, right? Like, I, yes. I mean, I think like, I've, 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 I've got a 50 gig personal <laughs> mailbox, and that's after two, two years of, of being at one company, right? Like, I, I'm a hoarder. <laughs> yes. And these were, fortunately for me, these were fairly flat, not huge mailboxes. I mean, there were still a few thousand emails in it, but it wasn't uh, a big deal. There wasn't a lot of folders in it, any of that. So, it worked. We migrated all of those. And again, for me, it was only four mailboxes. So it took me maybe 40 minutes, an hour to do it. Way less time than I was going to spend battling access denied issues and can't find the SMTP address issues. 
But then last night we got an email and in the mix of everything, someone was like, wait a minute, this group should not have gone into this team. Those, well, they, well, they were named the same. They were two different groups of people. <laughs> G Suite was named the same way Teams was named. There were some assumptions made that they were the same. And lo and behold, they were not the same. Mm, turns out. Yes. So while dragging and dropping email into a Microsoft 365 group email works great. It moves it right in right away. Have you ever tried to get mail out of a Microsoft 365 mailbox? Group mailbox? <laughs> it's a slightly different experience. There's a reason they're down at the bottom of Outlook in both the, the, the desktop <laughs> client and the and, and the real client. Or I guess the web client. I, I would think like off the cuff, off the top of my head, I would say where your path to success sounded like it was Outlook Web Access the first time. That would not have been my inclination the second time. I would have almost wanted to just do it through the client and deal with the pain of having to move everything like locally, client side, like yep. shift from here to here and then wait for the client to re upload it rather than waiting for that kind of just magic sauce, instant gratification of OA with a regular mailbox. Yeah, that doesn't work either. Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees, they want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intelligent.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intelligent focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. You cannot copy and move emails out of a group mailbox at all, no matter what. Oh, a desktop client, all of that just through error after error about not being able to copy, not being able to move. Is that because they're not emails and they're conversations? They're conversations, yes. Sitting in a mailbox. However, what does work is the compliance center in an e-discovery search of a mailbox that gets exported to a PST. So before we get into that, though, like you, so it's a very one-way path. So it you is, can absolutely. go, you, but I'm saying in the sense like you can go from a Microsoft 365 group to a Microsoft 365 group mailbox, quote unquote, like quote unquote conversation mailbox, I guess. But you can't go the other way. I can't go from a conversation mailbox back out to something else. Back out to like a shared mailbox or something like that. As far as I was able to figure out and all of my searching was in vain in terms of going from that shared mailbox, or not going from that shared mailbox, but going from a group, like going in, grabbing an email out of the group, doing a drag and drop or anything like that into another mailbox. Like you can try it. You can't even drag it into your own mailbox. So if you go to a group and you see a conversation in there and you just grab it and like try to drag it to your own inbox, it looks like it works. It doesn't throw any errors, but it will never show up in your mailbox. It just it doesn't work. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So off to the So off to eDiscovery. Off to the Purview Compliance Center we go. Yes. So I went off to the Purview Compliance Center and ran a content search. You don't necessarily have to do an eDiscovery or a legal hold, but I did a content search and then 
Within that content search, you can say what mailbox do you want to search. And in here, you can put a Microsoft 365 group mailbox. I put no other conditions on it. Just go search this mailbox and do a content search of it and let that run. And then once you have that content search done, you can export the results of the content search as a PST file. Okay, so I get ye old PST, and then I'm back to a PST migration. So you go from like, <laughs> it's an element changing state. It's like water to ice to vapor and steam, oh. and then all of a sudden it recondensates, and oh, I've got water again. It absolutely is. However, <laughs> all of this said, so now I have my PST, I opened up the email, and part of what happened, because we brought these two email addresses together and had aliases, now not only do I have to get these out of these groups, but I have to re-separate these emails between these two mailboxes. Because when we did the migration, we merged what was already in the team with what came from the G Suite into a Mm -hmm. single mailbox, and now I have to re-separate them so I can go to a shared mailbox and keep the stuff in the team that's in the team or essentially delete all of the shared mailbox stuff out of the team. So, and this is where my local client came in. So now that I have my PST, I have all my email in there. I was able to pull that PST into my local Outlook client or I could have done a PST migration at least for those emails that had to go to a shared mailbox. But you can't do a PST migration into a Microsoft 365 mailbox. (laughs) Yes, there are some other limitations there when it comes to shipping through the PST import service. (laughs) Yes. So what I ended up doing, I got this PST into my local Outlook. I created some local Outlook rules to separate these two groups of emails into their respective, based on who the email was sent to, I could use a two filter and the Outlook client and separate them out into two different folders, all locally, opened up the local PST and Outlook, and then dragged the files. So I opened up the shared mailbox, dragged those up into the shared mailbox. That one was no problem. Then I went to drag these local files out of the PST for the team, And I just deleted everything out of the team, wiped out the team inbox, and then grabbed these emails and was going to re-upload them. But guess what? You can't drag and drop emails from a local PST into a group in the Outlook desktop client. Say that one more time for me. So you can't drag and drop. You cannot copy emails from a local PST into a group inbox. But you can copy emails from an online mailbox into a group mailbox. Into a group mailbox. So now we're on to, this is like step six of 368 of local PST. Now you've got to drag it into an online mailbox and get it all to, I imagine, wait for it to sync from the client locally. And we all know how performant Outlook is when it comes to doing network sync Organization for a massively important <laughs> number of emails. And then you go the other way. And then you can drag and drop them from the online mailbox. So I just did like a subfolder in my personal mailbox, dragged them up there, let them upload, and then I dragged them from there over to the group mailbox. Sounds like a great path to success. That's rough. Like You're reminding me of how painful migrations are, not just for the end user side of it, but again, that like I, I have that empathy for the folks who actually do the migration. Like there's certainly the disruption to business, you know, maybe on like a Monday morning when you come in and your stuff's not migrated, but there's also the person who worked over the weekend to get your entire <laughs> migration done in time. And they feel really bad that it's still in process and, and running through. It was frustrating to have to work with these group mailboxes. Along the as it went, I did find out though, if anybody is looking to do this, these are a couple new-ish features that are in the group mailboxes. You used to not be able to create folders or configure rules on group mailboxes. 
there are a couple flags you can set now in the organizational config. So it's set, set, get organizational config. There's a couple flags that you can set that enable you to actually create subfolders now on an inbox of a group conversation, as well as in only OWA at this point in time, create, I would say, rudimentary rules at best on these mailboxes, which is kind of cool because up until now, there wasn't a whole lot of options for sorting or if you are using like a group mailbox for maybe support or sales or something like that, those rules allow you, again, to do some very basic stuff like based on the sender, based on the recipient, maybe if you have some additional aliases, to create some rules and let those run an incoming email to help you sort those maybe into some subfolders or you can do a little bit of forwarding with them as well. It is all still disabled by default. I enabled those. I did try these rules to split out that email because you can do it on the sender. But at this point in time, it appears from everything I did that it only works on incoming email. Well, they do have like the play button to run the rule now. It didn't actually seem to work. Because I set it up, I sent some emails to it, and it was able to grab them, sort them, filter them. But if I tried to run the rule on the existing email, I couldn't get anything to go. Gotcha. Uh, So question about that. That's a relatively new feature. Yep. That was supposed to launch late last year. Has it been flighted all the way? Like you didn't run into any issues in your tenant? I I was, while you were chatting, I went and looked in the roadmap, and it says it's still rolling out or it's GA. It's not very... Clear. I, I'm just wondering, like, you didn't run into any issues. You didn't have to do like a pre-release, anything like that kind of thing. It was just there and available and ready to go for you. Yeah, it was just there. I had to go set my permissions right. It's the whole RBAC permissions in Exchange Online, in that they don't surface certain commandlets or even certain parameters unless you have the right permissions. So I did have to go. Even though I was a global admin, I did have to go tweak some permissions on my account to give myself right to run the set organizational config and get organizational config. But in terms of enabling those features, I set them, didn't have to do any flighting, any previews of anything. They lit right up and I was able to see the rules, create the rules. Creating folders took a little bit longer than creating the rules did to light that up. And there are a couple different parameters there too. There's one that once you set it, the admins can do it. And if you want group members to be able to do it, you have to set another parameter to true. The other nice thing is you can go set this up and you can then disable it and it prevents creating anything new, but existing folders and rules will continue to function and continue to work. So that was something nifty discovered amidst my frustration. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst all the other chaos. Yes. So if anybody's ever wanted to do folders or rules, and there's, I'll throw the documentation too out there for managing it. Microsoft has the documentation for setting the flags and some of those details on it as well. All It is all working now. <laughs> many, many sleepless nights later, you're ready to go? I'm ready to go. I think everything now is in a halfway decent spot. And this was kind of the last thing. We had a status call this morning on it. This was, there's little stuff here and there, but this was kind of our last big thing to get fixed. Well, it's always good to reach the end of a migration too and kind of celebrate that. Like, hey, we made it. We figured it all out. We've got a set of learnings. Uh, you probably, it sounds like you have a good set of learnings to kind of go back and playbook for the next one and have some good questions to ask and ways to justify the time or the pricing or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. So, and again, the biggest thing for me, it was I had never done this much with trying to manage email in a Microsoft 365 group before. I've used it for the inbox. But yeah, there's just some weird stuff. It is not a shared mailbox like you would expect it to be or like I even envisioned in my head when I would talk about it or hear about these mailboxes associated with groups. They're a whole different breed of mailbox. Always fun. (laughs) Yeah, you're just living that dream, yeah. I am. 
Absolutely. So now it's time for the weekend. Well, now it's time to catch up on all the work I didn't get done because I was dealing with Microsoft group mailboxes. <laughs> Gotcha. Well, that was fun to hear about. I always like to hear about some of the real world stuff that you're encountering encountering out there. Be, be it easy, hard, painful, whatever it happens to be. If anybody has any questions, they can always reach us on Discord. If they're a member, you can reach out to us on Twitter. Unfortunately, you have to do that through the official Twitter <laughs> apps because Elon killed third-party Twitter clients today. Hopefully he brings those back. Uh, we shall see. You can find me at, on Tumblr at blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't know where yeah. I'm going to go, but Tumblr might be next for me. That's the rate I'm going. I, I'm just, I'm not going to say anything. I'll just leave it with Tumblr. <laughs> I've got you all distracted now. Uh, no, you don't, you don't have me distracted. The chat has me distracted. You should really get your contractors to work harder, you know? I really should. As one of them's in there and uh, going at it. I was yeah. going to ask you if they can't find you on Twitter, can they find desktop icons? But that might take us down a whole nother rabbit hole. Yeah, teaser. I think next week, and we can hold ourselves to this one, we should talk yep. about all the fun things that happened with Microsoft Defender on 13 January. I consider it the day when Microsoft decided to delete all of the desktop icons and shortcuts <laughs> for a whole bunch of programs and broke a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, the beauty of the Defender one is it doesn't just break Office. Like, I absolutely feel for anybody who felt this pain like on this Friday and probably into the course of the weekend, depending on, on how long it took them to course correct. But because quite often, like, link files are used uh, as a part of shortcuts from other apps, it breaks all sorts of stuff, oh. right? Like, your VS Code. Code integrations, Visual Studio, all sorts of stuff in like Edge gets broken. Anything you're trying to do like in the Outlook client that you already had open, like it's a mess if you're a Windows user today. <laughs> I've, I've reverted to Mac for some things. So if you don't use Twitter and you don't use Windows, Friday the 13th was a good day. If you use either of those, you might as well have just not even tried to work today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That about sums it up. Oh, all right. Well, thanks, Scott. Go enjoy your nice, cool weekend. Try not to work. And hopefully Monday, the whatever the date will be, the 16th, will be much better for everybody. Monday's a holiday in the U.S. So oh, that's to right. Those, to those that get it off, like hopefully they all had a good holiday too. But yes, we shall chat again next week as always. Thank you, Ben, and talk to you later. All right. Thank you. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five-star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.